and this little girl was sitting on that concrete block. This child was taken when she was seven. Her parents were killed in the earthquake in Haiti. Nobody knew she was alive. She didn't speak for two weeks after the sting operation. And I wasn't there, but what I was told is that her very first words that she said were, I didn't think anybody would come. Welcome to the Liberating Humanity podcast. This is Paul Hutchinson. We're going back to Haiti on this podcast. In fact, the rescue mission that the documentary Operation Toussaint was loosely based on was from the operations that I'm going to share with you. I went into Haiti eight different times. I'm going to share you all the details of what happened on those separate missions because we wanted to find all of the traffickers that we could. We wanted to cut the head off the dragon. I was tired. The other operators were tired of trafficking continuing to come up and little stings and little operations, but never really getting to the head of the dragon and shutting down the operations that were happening in Haiti. And so it all started many years ago. I got a phone call from the Homeland Security agent. He said, we really want to get Glenn Beck and his team to come and film some of the, the orphanages that, that have some of the kids that have been rescued there in Haiti. And he wanted to take him there on a, on a private jet. At the time, I had plenty of money and plenty of friends with plenty of planes. And so I said, you know what? I'm, I'm happy to help. And at the time, my son had just returned from a two-year mission. He was, he was out and providing service to the people in Texas. And while he was gone, I had, I had gotten a divorce with his, his mom. And he was trying to figure out if I was still a good guy or not. And so two days after he came back home, I put him on a Gulfstream jet uh, with me and the Homeland Security agent, some others, and we flew back to Texas where he served, picked up Glenn Beck, and we flew to Haiti. And we spent two or three days just doing pictures of and videos of the orphanages, Glenn just getting a good feel for what was going on there in Haiti. Well, it was Saturday night. It was about 10 o'clock at night. We were flying out at 6 a.m. the next morning. And the Homeland Security agent comes to me and he said, Paul, I've had teams out on the ground for the last five, six days, and they haven't found any good leads, any, any connections with the traffickers. He said, you're, you're one of the best that we've worked with. Can, are, are you willing to go out with them? And I, I knew that meant that I would get no sleep that night. When you're doing operations, especially when you're starting at 10, 11 at night, you're out till pretty late. So... He lined me up with some of the other team members that were there, and we, we got some intel of some of the smaller leads that they got, but not anything really big. And they sent with us a federal agent who was, who was armed, which was good because Haiti is not the most safest place on the planet. In fact, I you know, just did another podcast, Dominican Republic, and Haiti and the Dominican Republic share the same island and are, are technically the same should be the same environment. You know, you have, you, unfortunately, you get more hurricanes and earthquakes and a lot of natural disasters that are, that hit the Haitian side. And, you know, some people may say, hey, that's God trying to punish the people. Other people say, hey, it's just kind of where it sits. The, the reality is Haiti is a difficult place to live. There's so much poverty. There's over 80% of the population of Haiti live below the poverty line. In fact, the, the average income in Haiti is, is what the average American would earn in a week, is what the Haitians will earn in an entire year. It's sad. It's sad to see the poverty. It's sad to see the corruption. But what's really sad is seeing the effect of that poverty, of that corruption on the children. These are kids that are not only Haitian kids, there are children that are brought across the border from the Dominican Republic side, and they're being sold. They're being sold for organ harvesting. They're being sold into sex trafficking, and they're being sold into labor camps as well. And we have a, a number of operations that we have done in trying to identify some of the kids that were brought into some of these labor operations. We've done another one where the operators went in just to take down an orphanage that was selling kids for organ harvesting, et cetera. This one was a follow-up in which we were trying to take down any potential trafficking rings that may have information on a little boy by the name of Gardy. 
Uh, Gardy was one that even before my time in being involved in the child rescue work was somebody that uh, a little boy that was kidnapped at four years old in front of a church house. His dad was serving in his church at the time as the leader of his church. And this little boy was taken and the traffickers asked for a ransom. The father paid it, a portion of it. They asked for more. And then, of course, uh, he was gone. This little boy was gone. This, this has been a few years that had passed, but many different operations were, were put together in Haiti for the purpose of following up with this little boy. In fact, one of my favorite stories was early on when they had identified some trafficking rings that they thought he was likely sold to. And they went in and they took down these trafficking rings and came back. And of course, he wasn't there. And the operators went and talked to the dad and said, hey, you know what? Your, your son wasn't there. We did find 27 children that were. And the father was sad for a minute. And then he looked up and he said, you wouldn't have come. If my boy hadn't been taken, you wouldn't be here looking for him. And those 27 children would still be in slavery today. He said, if I had to lose my son so that those children could be free, that's a burden I'm willing to bear. And with all of the operations that we did in Haiti, starting out with the pursuit and looking for his, his, that little boy, over 100 plus victims have been recovered, returned to their families, and are living healthy lives again because of that one little boy. Now, we hope and pray that someday he'll be found. He hasn't yet. Uh, it's been a lot of years. All we can do is hope and pray that he's in a good place. So back to this trip to Haiti where we we took Glenn back and we're going to the different orphanages. He's filming some of those. 10 o'clock at night, the Homeland Security agent comes to me and says, Paul, can go out? And I knew that would meant that I'd get very little sleep that night because we're going to be out till two or three in the morning. And I agreed to go. We have some of the other operators. I mean, they got tattoos and earrings and, you know, some of them former special forces guys, and they, they look it. I think one of the reasons why these traffickers weren't that intimidated with me is because I'm, I'm, I'm just this, you know, I'm, I'm not big and bulky. I don't have huge muscles. I don't have the tats all over that might be, might or might not be from the military, you know? And so, so I agreed to go and I've got these other operators and, and they sent with us, they sent a, a federal agent who was armed. And so we went out, we went to a bunch of different clubs and stuff. And every time we went to a club, he would have to check his weapon at the door. I'm like, how is this incognito, right? We're literally, and this has happened a number of times in different operations. When, when we're required to take a local police officer or undercover agent with us, it hurts our ability to find the traffickers, to connect with the right people because they look and smell like a cop a lot of times. And a typical American that is there looking for underage uh, prostitutes or children that are being sold and, you know, doing horrible things there, they're, they're not going to have a local that looks like a cop there with them. It, it went on until almost midnight, a little after one, and the federal agent said, hey, you know, I'm going to go to bed. And we said, hey, we're going to stay out here. We hadn't found any real good connections. And we had separated with some different groups that were out. And I had a smaller group that was with me. And I said, guys, are you good if I if I take lead, are you good with that? And they said, yeah, yeah. They said, you're really good at this. I want to see what you do. And, um, and I told this whole story to Glenn when we got on the plane the next morning in detail. Um, but I said, guys, I need you to understand one thing. I believe in God. I don't want to make this a religious conversation, but this is an important part of this mission and many, many others. I said, I believe in God. Most people believe in a supreme being of sorts. They may call him or her by different names. They may say the universe or Heavenly Father or Jehovah or Allah. I mean, the list goes on and on of, of what people would consider the name of God. I said, that's not relevant. What is relevant is that God exists and cares more about these children than you and I ever could and knows exactly where they are. If you're okay with it, even if you're not, I'm going to start out by asking for some help. So here we are, downtown Port-au-Prince, Haiti, the darkest, most voodoo-infested place on the Western Hemisphere, and, and we take off our hats and we offer up a prayer. 
Then I said, guys, I need you to understand how I see fear and faith. I said, most people think that faith is going to church and asking God to fix things in their life that they don't believe are going to be fixed. Now, this is important. They don't believe are going to be fixed, right? If you don't believe it's going to happen, it's empty. It's just empty. It's just empty wishes. I said, the principle of faith, faith is the most powerful, one of the most powerful laws in the universe, next to, you know, unconditional love and, you know, some other high vibration stuff. But faith, unwavering faith. In fact, for you who are Christians, there's a, there's a scripture in, in James that talks about ask in faith, nothing wavering. Now, that's the, that's the key. Most people have a hard time with unwavering conviction about anything. Should I marry this woman? Should I start this new job? Should I move to this new city? Should we have kids? I mean, the list goes on. And, and they don't know if, if what they want, if what they desire, if that's in line with what their God wants, you know, their version of God. And so, so it's difficult. It's difficult for people to have that unwavering faith. When I'm undercover, when, they, when we're there in these that seeing the darkest part of humanity, it's easy for me in that situation to have unwavering conviction that we're going to find the kids. Why? There's not a powerful, virtuous intelligence in the universe anywhere that's okay with an eight-year-old being raped. So it's easy for me to have that unwavering conviction that we're going to find those kids. So I, I tell these, these Navy SEALs this, these, you know, these guys that were out there with us, and they're like, oh, okay, dude, you know, whatever. And, and uh, I said one other thing. I said, you guys have seen the movie. If you've had kids, you've seen the movie Finding Nemo, right? And then the, the other one, the, the, the sequel to it, Finding Dory. You know, Finding Dory, this, this stupid fish, it has, she has a two-second memory, and her parents are somewhere in the ocean complex, wherever it might be, right? And she just, she just operates on this, keep on swimming, you know, wherever it goes, and eventually she finds her parents. I, I told the guys that were with me, I said, guys, I might operate a little bit like Dory tonight because I, I'm not going to follow logic and protocol. I'm going to follow this. I put my hand on my heart. I said, every single person has the ability to feel and recognize that spirit of truth. So again, these guys are like, okay, dude, whatever. Let's, let's just drive. So I said, drive, just drive. And we're driving. I said, okay, stop right there. He said, that, that black alley, that motor, yeah, that motorcycle guy. He said, what are you going to do? I said, that guy knows something. I can feel it. And this happens on every single rescue mission. But when we're out there in these most dangerous places, and we're doing what I believe is the most noble good in finding these kids, the, the windows of heaven open, and, and there are so many beautiful things that happen that keep our team safe and that help lead us to where these kids are. I get out of the van, and these guys are like, you know, we got to survey this area. I said, you know, this is a super dangerous area. We don't have time for that. In fact, you guys are going to intimidate this guy. You know, they got tattoos and, you know, big dudes. So, so I get out and I walk up to this guy. And as I get close, he pulls up his shirt and there's a gun. There's a gun that's tucked into his pants. He doesn't say a word. I don't say a word. And I pulled out some money. I don't remember what it was, 20, maybe it, it might have been 100. And I gave him the cash. And he said, what's that for? I said, that's for you. You keep it. I said, I have another one for you if you can help me with something. I said, I have a friend in the US. He's got lots of money. He pays me to go find stuff for him. And um, he wants to come and have a party here. And uh, he likes he likes 10-year-olds. And this guy's like, your friend's f***ed up. And I said, yeah, he is. But he pays me really well. And I'll give you another 100 bucks if you can get me in touch with somebody who can provide what he's looking for. He said, I know somebody. I knew he did. I could feel it. I could feel it. He picks up his phone, makes a phone call, gets me on the phone with a female, Miss D. She owned the, a bunch of strip clubs in the area, and she was making money selling children 
on the side, making a lot of money selling children. So, so he introduced me to her. She says, yeah, yeah, I can provide everything that you're looking for. You know, meet me at this, this club, the strip club. And uh, so I give him, give him the cash, get back in the car. We drive to this place. Now that connection, just listening and following through with that one ended up in one of the largest child rescue missions in all of Haitian history. And more important than the number of kids that were rescued there, it was the number of high, high level traffickers that we were able to get in the door with that were connected, unfortunately, with some of high, high level politicians that were in Haiti as well. So we go to this club and, and you know, you don't meet traffickers at the Ritz Carlton. So, you know, you guys can judge me all you want at this point, but yeah. The, the traffickers usually will own a strip club or they'll own a, you know, a massage parlor that, that offers extra services. These are, these are typical for a lot of these traffickers. So we go in and we meet with Miss D. She comes out in the lobby area. We're talking with her. She said, yeah, I'm going to be off. And she said, a lot of my young girls are already asleep because this was like almost two in the morning by this time. So we, we connect with her. We get her contact information. She shows a bunch of pictures. She had a, a friend by the name of Dolo. That, uh, that met us just briefly outside um, that, that promised us that he had plenty of connections with children as well and that, that they had some there selling. So, these guys seemed like what I call level twos, okay? They, uh, they're running a business on the side. They're pimping uh, women. They have access to the children. We've got to get through them. We've got to find out who their suppliers are so that we can identify where the kids are being held and so that we can bring those children out and, of course, rescue them that way and take down the entire network, not just guys that are selling, the guys who are behind the scenes as well. So the next morning we flew home. And over the next three or four months, I went back in eight different times. Now, Haiti takes a long freaking time to get there. I mean, you've got to fly on a red-eye flight from where I lived in, in Salt Lake, red-eye flight to Atlanta. So you're already tired and then boom, you fly into Haiti. It takes a, almost a whole day to get there. About one in the afternoon, the next day is when you finally get in if we're leaving the midnight the night before. So I flew back in a couple weeks later. We always follow the rule that you never are alone with these traffickers. So I, I'll bring in a security team. Usually Joseph would come in. Jimmy came on a few of them. Andy came on a few of them, et cetera. So we flew back in to meet with Miss D and find out who she was working with and how many kids that she had. So the first day we get back in, I reconnect with this same, same lady who owned the strip club. And she showed us some pictures of five girls that she was pimping. And the girls, they looked young, but we couldn't tell for sure. And we had a translator that was there with us because a lot of them just spoke Haitian or Creole. And, and we found out that all five of them were either 18 or 19. Now, here's the thing, guys. Those girls were being trafficked. Unfortunately, our focus was just on the children. But the good thing is when we take down these trafficking networks, every single one of these guys who are selling children are also pimping out older girls as well. In almost every single rescue mission, not only do we rescue the kids, but we, we are able to get healing in place and, and a safe house in place for these older victims as well. But at that point, I tell Miss D, I said, you know what? Sorry, you just lied to me. When I'm, when I'm doing this work, we, we always maintain a level of posture just barely, barely above where the traffickers are so we can control the situation. If they try to do anything above here, if they put us in a dangerous situation, if they lie to us, whatever else, I don't just barely go over the top. I go, boom, right here. I, I'm like, you know, F you, we're done type thing. And so I told her, I said, you know what? You just screwed up. You lied to me. You told me that those girls were, were minors and they weren't. They were all over 18. So I'm sorry, but we're not going to work together and I'm going to go somewhere else to, to find. And she's, oh, no, 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 no. I have connections. I, every single time they do, they've got the connections with the younger ones, but they want to present you with the easier ones first. I've got to get through them to find their supplier to where the, the little kids are. That's where we need to find out. And she said, I have somebody. I have somebody who can provide. She says, I briefly introduced you, you to him before, but I'll get him back over. And this was that dodo guy. He's got this bullet bike that's just loud as crap. And he comes rolling in on this, this bullet bike. And again, he seemed like a level two. He had access to the kids and we needed to find out who was holding them, where they were going to be coming from. Otherwise, we couldn't identify where they were being held. We couldn't rescue them there. And we couldn't, of course, bring them to the party. So Dolo, the guy that we met the very, very first night there, 
through the guy who, you know, just listening, uh, connected us with them. He ended up bringing another 10 victims, uh, children, to just outside the club that Miss D owned. And so we verified these guys really had kids. Unfortunately, they weren't taking us to where they were keeping the kids yet. They didn't trust us enough for that. But we were gaining trust with them, relationships to the point where we were hoping that eventually they would. So later on, we we got invited to visit with Miss D at her house. We were able to not only tag the places that she was keeping the kids, we were able to tag her home as well, just in case she didn't come to the sting and we could go ahead and have the federal agents take him down. This was the fourth time back since the beginning when we first connected with the owner of the strip club and a bunch of these other ones. By then, we had created a level of trust with some of these lower level traffickers. And a few of them had referred us to a lady by the name of Francois. And what was interesting, there was, a, I believe it was a young kid that was there in the park that says, hey, I'm gonna take you to this lady, which was super interesting why he would even know what we were looking for. I guess the message had gone around town where people knew what we were looking for. So we get introduced to who we called Cho. Her real name was Francois. And if you watch Operation Tucson, it has a highlight on her. She's a you know, big, big heavy lady with no soul whatsoever. We got taken by a couple other lower level traffickers to a place where she was. And she had this door. It was four feet wide, steel door, red, seven plus feet tall, big steel door, sticks a key in this steel door. And she opens up this steel door. And the first thing I see was a, it was a alleyway, kind of a dirt floor hallway type thing and dimly lit some, you know, lights. Most of them were blown out. It was super dark in there. She then has multiple cell doors down the left-hand side and she sticks a key in one of these cell doors and it opens up. These cells were about five feet wide and maybe six feet deep, if that. No windows. No door except for this small steel door. And the first thing that I saw was a, it wasn't even a bed. It was a metal, it was a steel plank that was, it was held to the wall with a chain. And sitting on this bed was a, a blanket, a little dingy, holy, dirty blanket. No pillow, no mattress. And to the left of that plank, was a concrete block. And this little girl was sitting on that concrete block. This child was taken when she was seven. Her parents were killed in the earthquake in Haiti. Nobody knew she was alive. She didn't speak for two weeks after we rescued her. And I'll go through the details of the rescue in just a minute, but I'll highlight her for a minute. She didn't speak for two weeks after the sting operation and the rescue. And I wasn't there, but what I was told is that her very first words that she said were, I didn't think anybody would come. Because she gave up hope. She gave up hope seven years ago. And what makes me so mad is that every single man who walked through that door for seven years was there to rape her. What has humanity gotten to where, where, where that many people can come without a soul, without a conscience, without something inside of them later saying, oh, you know what? That's where they're holding the kids. Me and Andy were the first ones to come through that door without that intention. Now, from what I hear, that child is in a healthy home, learning to dance back in school. Every one of these kids have that same Beautiful story, something in their past that they had a healthy home, maybe at one time, maybe they didn't, but all of them, all of them deserve to live a life free of those chains of bondage. So the, this trafficker went down this hallway, and there was multiple cell doors, kids in them, and at the end, there was a, a larger room, a queen-size mattress on the floor where the unthinkable would happen. Condoms laying around, horrific sight, horrific. In fact, later, 
when uh, I had another operator, a couple other operators that came back in, uh, we had a, a translator with us that time that was really getting some extra intel before we did the sting. I told the trafficker, I said, hey, it's super dark in here. Can I? And I showed her my phone and I showed her with me just turning on my flashlight of the phone. So then my flashlight's going because when you're at, at night in a dark area like that, if you're recording your video, your light's going to go on and they're going to suspect something. So I just showed her, I said, hey, I'm turning on my flashlight. I just showed her the trafficker like that. So the flashlight went on and then I, I covertly switched it over so that it was the camera instead. And I, I was able to get video footage of this red door, of the hallway, of these cell doors in which these kids were being held of this mattress at the end of the hallway with the condoms around it where the unthinkable would happen. Yeah, this, he's, he's got little beds in them on, on steel. These have beds on steel? Yep. yep. So this, 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 is, this is a This is a brothel this is a room. Yeah. yeah, he's a room. She's got keys to the rooms. This is unthinkable conditions here. Oh, and, and there's condoms laying around on the floor. Oh, oh here's, here's some that are open. Can you get her ex Oh, that's good. Oh, my guy! <laughs> that's a new. That's a new one. Because the ones they had in the other were just like, just rich. And so we we said to her, "Yep, yep, this is what our boss wants. Absolutely, yeah." And we exchanged contact information with her, and and left. That was a big win. Why? Because that's what I call the level three. These are the ones who are physically holding the children in captivity. We've geotagged the location. And so badly, so badly, I wanted to just send in the guys and do the sting right there and pull those kids out because we knew where they were. We knew where they were. But if we did that, we ran the chances of this lady having other kids that weren't there, that were in another location that we already had heard about, that we would miss. We wouldn't be able to get to them. And the other traffickers as well, there was no way we could pull it all together unless we had a coordinated strike. And so went back in multiple times. We ended up meeting multiple female traffickers while we were there. And I have a hard, I have a hard time with a guy trafficking children. It's even more foreign to me that a mother would traffic her own children or a female would traffic young kids. One thing that I found is that the, the level one guys, the ones that are selling us cocaine at two in the morning in the dangerous areas, those guys are almost always dudes. The level two, the ones who are controlling women who are pimps and have access to children, I'd say that about 75% of them are guys, but upwards of a quarter of them are women who are engaged in selling other women for prostitution and in some cases, children. When you get to what I call the level three, the ones who are physically holding the children in some sort of captivity, inevitably half of them or more are women. When you're selling a child, you need to, you need to be put in a place where you can't harm that child ever again. However, from a compassionate standpoint, we have to take a bigger look at humanity and say, how do people end up in that position? A position where they think that it's okay to make money selling children. And inevitably, almost every one of these people, men and women both, experience significant trauma as a child. Most of them were trafficked themselves. And this is all they know. The only way, the only way that we're going to fix this problem is by elevating the consciousness of all of humanity, figuring out how to help regular people like you and I heal, heal through our own childhood trauma, our own things that we're holding on to that are out of integrity, and get to a place where we see each other 
everybody on earth as a child of God, as somebody who is divinely connected to their creator. And once we start changing how we see each other and we resolve our own childhood trauma, we will save millions of children. So back to Haiti. We went back in multiple times. I connected with some additional traffickers. Uh, there was one female that was was selling kids. Um, these were 12 to 15-year-old girls that she was selling, and it seemed like they were living at home. She had groomed them. She had convinced them that they could make some extra money on the side. It's amazing to me how many of these victims actually sleep in their own beds at night. It creates a situation where we as parents need to be hyper-vigilant about what's going on with our children. You know, when they're going over to a friend's house, are they really just going to the friend's house or is there a brother that's grooming them there or even the friend that's grooming them and convincing them that they should sell their body and, and do some things that are completely out of the moral standards that you taught your family? Um, maybe... You know, they're being coerced. Maybe somebody got a picture of them in a, in a precarious situation, maybe naked, and they're, they're threatening them, saying, hey, I'm going to send this out all over the school unless you do X, Y, and Z. This happens all the time. You need a relationship with your kids where they can very easily come to you and tell you really what's going on. A couple female traffickers that were selling children, uh, underaged victims that were that we're still living at home. We exchanged contact information with them, putting together this entire case, just in case some of them don't end up coming to the sting. On one of these trips, the eight different times that, that uh, we went in to set up the operation, uh, one of the times we went in, one of the orphanage, guest knows orphanage, was completely out of food. And I was under the impression that the foundation that we were working with at the time was taking care of all of that, that that's where our money from our big galas and stuff we're going for was taking care of some of these orphanage, these, these trafficked children, making sure that there was not only, I mean, food is on the low end of the totem pole. They, they should absolutely be getting food every single day. In addition to that, there needs to be enough resources in place for them to have healing. They need to have therapists in place or facilitators of people that can help them heal through their trauma because just pulling them out of hell and putting them into a, an orphanage and then they're, they don't have enough food, are you kidding me? That's not what needs to happen. So we went to the store. We literally, we spent like $1,000, which is a lot of money in Haiti, and we bought everything we could possibly buy that would sustain them not only for the next week, but a lot of things that had a longer shelf life that would sustain them for months and months on end. I believe this was the sixth time that I went into Haiti with, with some members of a team beyond that original contact where we were there with the orphanages. And on this one, we had finally built trust enough with Francois, with Cho, the female trafficker, with the, the, the kids that were being held in those cells with the big red door. Our relationship with her had gotten to the point where she agreed to meet us at her own house and show us some more things that we were looking for. And so we drove in, we, were, we had a motorcycle guy that was working for her that we followed into this really dangerous area, this uh, very drug-infested region of, of Port-au-Prince, Haiti, with uh, dilapidated houses everywhere, a lot of drug dealers out, prostitutes everywhere. And uh, we drove in, and looking at the map, there was only one way out of this area, and it was the way that we came in. There wasn't any other th thorough roads or anything else, since we were getting deeper and deeper into this neighborhood filled with traffickers and drug dealers and the likes. The trafficker pulls up in, in his motorcycle in front of this home. We get out, walk in, and Francois was there. This was her home, and she had, I believe, an additional six children that were being sold, that were being trafficked, that, were, that she had there at her house, including one of her own. And uh, these ones weren't locked up in the same situation that the other ones were, in that downtown area where we found the, the bed. Um, but nonetheless, this was a long ways away from typical civilization. Uh, we're, we're, we're in this dangerous community, a lot of drug dealers going on there, and, and these kids were there in her home. 
There was another six kids that were there. We continued to have a conversation with her about where things were going and what we were planning on doing when the party was coming up, et cetera. And uh, of course, geotagged the location of her home so that that could be given to the federal authorities as well. We drove out. We had myself, Andy. We had one of our translators there. And we had a guy by the name of Aaron. Aaron was Andy's brother. Aaron is huge. I mean, he's the, he's the type of body that could just walk on as a linebacker anywhere type guy, big guy. And we're, we're driving out and we, we have him there as our security. The traffickers are aware of the fact that, you know, we're working for a rich guy setting up a party. It's typical that we would have some security there. So he was there as our security, real security and show security. As we're driving out of this sketchy area, we're getting uncomfortable with the amount of time that... Francois wanted us to stay. We didn't know if we were going to be boxed in and, and taken out, robbed. We didn't know. So we we're like, hey, we got to go. We got to go. We got in our car. We started driving out. And lo and behold, as we come around this corner, leaving this neighborhood, there's a truck that's parked in the road. And it's such that we cannot take our car past it. There was no way that we could get past without causing some damage and scraping the side. And, and so Aaron gets out. He says, I'll handle this. And he gets out and grabs this truck. Now, it's not a big full-size pickup, but it's a truck. You know, it's a, so I think it was a little Toyota or something. So he picks up the side of this truck and, and pulls it over to the side so that we could drive through. That was kind of fun, having security that can pick up a truck and let us get through. But what was exciting about this trip was that we had gained a relationship, a level of trust with these traffickers to the point where she took us to her home. We could geotag that and make sure that that was on the list just in case any of those kids didn't end up coming to the sting. We also, on this same trip, ended up getting back in touch with Miss D, the owner of the strip club, who had a whole bunch of kids that she had shown us before, and she agreed to have us meet her at her home. We need to find out if indeed she was holding any kids because all the kids that she had shown us so far were being held somewhere else. She was simply an in-between person. So we needed to find out if she was holding anything at her home. So we ended up meeting her at her home. It was beautiful, absolutely gorgeous home that was sitting up on the hill. It's over. You could tell that compared to the average income in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, she was multiples above most people that were there. She was making a lot of money on her, her clubs and even more money in prostituting women and children. As we were sitting there with her, she got very, very graphic about some of the children that she had access to and what they were willing to do. She told us that the key to meeting more of the kids that she had access to was all through Dolo, motorcycle guy, guy that, uh, that we had met earlier. And so we made arrangements to visit with him later that day. He came in, he was wearing this, this silver chain and he was wearing a another chain that had a, a depiction of Jesus on the cross. And that bothered me. It bothered me because I've been raised as a Christian. I have a close relationship with my Creator. And, you know, whether it's a, whether it's a Buddha on his chain, whether it's Jesus on his chain, it's, it's always appalling to me on these rescue missions how many of the traffickers will either have a, a depiction of the cross on their arm as a, as a tattoo, or they'll be wearing some jewelry, they'll be wearing rosary beads, you know, or maybe they'll have a crescent uh, moon and a, and a sun in the middle of it with the Muslim faith. There's so many people who are professing their faith on their sleeve, on their tattoo, on their neck, yet their actions are so far removed from the teachings of Buddha, from the teachings of Jesus, from the teachings of all of these different religions, of these teachings of, of faith and, and acceptance and forgiveness and, you know, of, of a moral compass of some sorts. And I don't know if the traffickers are wearing these because they feel guilty. Maybe they're trying to make up for the fact that they're selling kids on the side. Maybe they're using it as a way for people to trust them. I don't know. But as I go deeper and deeper, it's appalling to me how so many people will use religion as a front to block out the view of their real life, of their pornography addiction, of their abuse of their children at home. All of these things that are just as damaging in some cases to family and to children as these traffickers. So 
as I as I see Dolo coming and he's got this cross on his chain, he's got the uh, the Christus on there, and I'm like, I, I feel uncomfortable with that at first. And I thought, you know what? If that's what traffickers are wearing, I need some more stuff like that. And so I said, I said, hey, look. I said, how about, uh, he, he wanted an extra tip for some girls that he showed on his phone. And I said, no, I'm not giving you extra money for somebody you show me on your phone. I don't even know if they're real and you have to take me to where they are. I said, but here's what I will do. I'll give you, I'll give you an extra tip for showing me those if you give me your chain, your necklace, your pendant. And I gave him a couple hundred dollars, which was big for people in, in Haiti. But for me, over the years, bought, I bought hats from the traffickers. I bought, I bought bracelets that had uh, you know gold and silver and a lot of religious things on some of them. And I bought his pendant and his necklace. Okay, so everything is set up for this rescue mission. I've got contacts throughout the entire city. We had worked our way up in almost every case to the people who were physically holding the children. And we decided that we were going to have the sting over Super Bowl Sunday. We told them, listen, we're going to have our boss fly in over Super Bowl Sunday. We're going to have a big party that's here. He's going to come in with a yacht. And I had a friend that for many, many years, he told me, Paul, if you can ever use my yacht on one of your rescues, I would be honored. And he had this, this catamaran. It was like 52 feet wide, right? This thing was huge. He sailed all around the world. In fact, I think we went to all seven seas in uh, sailing with this yacht. And it was stationed in Miami at the time. And so I told him, look, how about you do this? Bring it down and park it just right off the coast of Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And we'll, we'll use it as part of the sting operation. Because we had a couple very uh, large influencers, almost celebrity status uh, people that wanted to come and see some rescues. And so we needed to set it up in a way where they could be protected from everything going down on the, on the beach and the takedown, but they could still see everything that was going on. So he agreed to bring this boat down and the sting operation was scheduled for this Super Bowl Sunday, this following weekend. All of our security personnel, our Krav Maga guy, our Navy SEALs, Green Berets, all of the guys who I usually take in as security, they were already scheduled to come over that sting weekend. They already had taken time off for that. So when they had done that, they couldn't take the extra time off, many of them, to come earlier during the week. And I needed to go in one last time before the sting just to make sure that everybody was on track. Because there was, there was a few months between the, the first time that I went in and the last. I needed to make sure that everybody was ready. They were all going to be bringing their kids. Plus, the one that we hadn't got all the way to the supplier was the very first contact, this Miss D and Dolo. I needed to find out where they were getting their kids from. I needed to get that contact to make sure that all of the bad guys ended up coming to the sting and everybody got arrested. And so texting back and forth, they agreed to meet me on like a Tuesday. So I had to be there pretty much all week and setting up everything for that, that sting operation. So I called up all of the different security guys. None of them could come. And my other main operators, they couldn't come because they were all planning on coming the following weekend as well. I had to get in there. And I have a friend who had been friends with us for a long time. His name was Barry. And Barry had been an MMA fighter, a cage fighter, right? He, and he had been a fighter since he was a kid. He always saw himself as the bully's bully. When he was a little kid, he was bigger than most other kids. And if, if he saw some bullies that were beaten up on, on these other young little kids, he was the one that took care of business. And so he was always the one that picked up, picked up that role in ensuring the safety of children. And he had asked me for a long time, he goes, Paul, oh, please, 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 can I go? Can I go undercover? And, I, and every time I'm like, Barry, here's the problem. First of all, we've got over 300 special forces guys, Navy SEALs, Green Berets, and, and guys that, that used to serve in, in other three-letter agencies that all tried out to be doing undercover, very few people qualified to actually do undercover work because it's, a whole, it's not just knowing how to beat everybody up. You've got to be able to put on a different face and a smile when you need a smile and mad when you need to be mad, but you can't let yourself be controlled by the emotions of the situation. And I told him this, I said, Barry, I said, I know for a fact that the second that you meet a real life trafficker who's selling children, that trafficker won't be alive an hour later, maybe 10 minutes later. Am I right? He's like, yeah, you're probably right. I said, you have to get over that. There, we will blow the operation if you can't hold your cool. 
He says, okay, I promise I can. I called him up that night and I said, Barry, I said, do you have, um, do you have a passport? He goes, yeah. I said, um, what are you doing the next two days? He said, you tell me where I'll be there. I said, okay, here's what we're doing. And I've been working on this operation for the last few months. I've been in eight different times into Port-au-Prince, Haiti. I've connected with all of these traffickers. I'm super close with a lot of them. And they are bringing, we've identified well over 30 plus children that are being brought to this sting operation that we're doing this next Sunday over Super Bowl Sunday. I said, I don't have any other security that can come. Rule number one, nobody ever meets with the traffickers alone. I have to have a plus one that's there and preferably somebody that knows how to take care of business if things go south. He says, okay, good. I got it. I got it. I'll be there. So the next night we're flying in the red eye and it's late at night where literally it's a midnight flight that we're leaving Salt Lake. Evidently he had not slept at all the night before. He told me, he said, Paul, I'm sorry, but I just stayed up all night long. He said, I've been studying everything. I know where every hospital is. I know where every police department is. I know all the ingress, egress of all of them. I know how to get around the city. And I told him, I said, Barry, I'm super glad that you spent the time studying all that. That's great. I said, but just so you know, I've done 30 plus of these operation days undercover. Things don't get too crazy. You know, we've had a few situations where the traffickers suspected things and they had guys with guns and stuff. But as a general rule, our guys haven't gotten hurt yet. And this was before I lost one of my operators in Haiti. This is before our other operator in the Dominican got stabbed 20 plus times. But I mean, there were some hairy situations leading up to that, but nothing to the degree where you have to be that worried. And I said, you need to chill because if you come in with that kind of energy, you're going to tip off the traffickers. And they're going to know that there's something else going down and they're going to be worried. They're not going to bring their kids. I said, so just chill. And so he says, okay, yeah, I'll chill, chill. So we, we get in the plane, we're sitting there and it's midnight. I'm putting my neck pillow on and my, my eye patch on so I can, you know, get some sleep on the way there. And he's, he's super high energy, very, very ADD. And he's like, Paul, Paul, um, can, can we talk? I said, yeah, 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 let's talk. He said, hey, I just need to know, um, you know, where are we meeting them? I says, look, we're just, it's a restaurant. One of the other traffickers picked it out. Um, it's all cool though. I met with these guys a number of times. This is a really private area. We're meeting these kids tomorrow at one. He's okay. 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 I start getting ready to go to sleep again. He goes, okay, one more thing. I'm like, crap, Gary, what, what, what is it? He said, I need a sign. He said, if something goes bad, like if I see something that I need to tell you about, and we need to get our asses out of there. I need to know that I can tell you something covertly. And you know that we need to go. I said, okay, okay. Um, how about this? I said, uh, I've told all the traffickers, the big boss is named Mateo. Mateo's coming in this private yacht in over Super Bowl Sunday. Um, so why don't we do this? If something is amiss and we need to get out of there right now, then Mateo is mad, right? If you come to me and say, Mateo's mad, we're out. We're, we're gone. I'll, I'll just believe you. We'll get out of there. I said, if there's a red dot on my chest, then Mateo's pissed. He's like, okay, I got it. I got it. It's okay. That's, that's our code word. So I fall asleep on the plane. We land in, in Atlanta and then take the next flight over into Haiti. He didn't sleep the entire time, the whole time. He's up, he's writing notes, he's planning everything. And I'm like, so he's tired as crap. And uh, we land and, the, and we have to go straight to the place where we're meeting the traffickers. So we get picked up by our translator that's there. And, uh, and there was another guy that was there as well. His name was Matt. He, uh, he worked as a journalist. I think he was from Australia. So Matt was from Australia. He was a journalist just kind of keeping track of everything and writing his own, own pieces on this stuff. So they pick us up and they, we, I give him the address. And we go up this hill on the, on the hillside above Port-au-Prince. It's overlooking everything. There's this beautiful hotel. It was, it was probably a pimpin' hotel in the 60s, uh, maybe even the 50s. It was dead, completely dead. There was nobody there and, uh, except for the traffickers. So we get out. And as we're driving up there, first of all, Barry, is, he's my security, and he's looking at the maps. He's getting madder by the second. He said, Paul, uh, why didn't you give me the address of this place before? I said, because I just, literally, I just got it from the traffickers. They just sent it to me. He goes, Paul, he says, we can't, we can't do a meeting here. I said, yeah, we can. It's all good. Why? He goes, there's no way out. There's one road going out of this place, just one. He said, there's, if, if something goes bad, I have no way to keep you safe. 
I'm like, just chill, Barry, just chill. This is all going to be fine. Don't worry about it. We, we, we get up there to this, this hotel. There's this beautiful restaurant area that's overlooking the city. We go out there with some chairs. We're sitting there. And Barry takes a look around the, the perimeter. The, the traffickers weren't there yet. And he takes a look around and he comes back and he's even madder. He goes, Paul, he said, there is 30, 40 foot cliffs off the side everywhere. He said, if things fall apart, not only do we not have a place to drive out of here, he says, we can't get, we can't get away. He says, this is, this is stupid. This is the stupidest place that we could have a meeting with traffickers. Now, naive me, I'm like, Barry, I've done this 30 plus times. We're good. Just chill. It's super important by the time they get here that your stressed out energy is not around the kids. So I need you to just walk the perimeter. I'll tell them you're my security that's keeping everything safe, but you can't have this stress that's here around these kids and around these traffickers that's going to tip them off. He says, okay, okay, okay. So he's out walking. The traffickers show up and it's me, uh, the journalist from Australia, Matt, and our, our interpreter. And so we're there just sitting there talking with the traffickers. They brought a whole bunch of kids. I don't remember. I believe there was nine children that were brought for us to verify they had what we were hoping they had. Now, again, they're bringing them from places. We needed to geotag where they're keeping the kids, but they still weren't comfortable enough with us to, to take us where they were keeping the kids. But they were committing to us. They, they would for sure bring all of the children to the party that we we're having over Super Bowl Sunday. And so we're talking back and forth and we, we bought some, some ice cream and some uh, French fries for the kids and they were eating separate. And we were talking back and forth about what was going to go on with the party and what time they should be there with the kids, et cetera. And then all of a sudden, Barry comes up to me and he whispers in my ear and he says, Paul, Mateo is pissed. Now I'm I'm looking for a red dot on my chest, right? Because that's what we decided on. Is if if something bad was going on, then Matt was, then Mateo was mad. If Mateo's pissed, we got to leave now. Like something big's going on. I'm like, he are you sure? He goes, I'm sure. We got to go. We got to go. I'm like, crap. So I tell the traffickers, I said, you know, there's something going on. My boss is mad about something. I've got to I've got to go deal with this. And so I threw some cash down. I said, promise me you'll meet all now. Now these traffickers were supposed to introduce me to their supplier. This was what I call the, the level three, the level four actually at this point that, that was bringing the kids into them. And, and that supplier was supposed to show up with two more children. And so we were leaving before this. This was the culmination of technically what I had been working for with this group of traffickers right from the beginning, figuring out where they're getting their kids. And so for us to have to leave before that person even gets there was, was disconcerting. And so as we're walking out, I'm, say, I'm like, Barry, are you sure? He goes, I'm sure. And we get in the car and I said, okay, what's going on? As so we're starting to drive down this hill, I said, so what's going on? What happened? He goes, well, the, the guys in the, the restaurant, they were, they were arguing about something and, and, and I could hear them arguing about it. And I said, well, well what were they arguing about? What, what were they saying? He goes, I don't know. They were, they were talking in, in Haitian. I said, Barry. I said, they were probably arguing about whoever gets the next lunch break or who's off tomorrow. How do you know that we had to? I said, I'm pissed. I said, my level, my level four was supposed to be showing up with two more kids. I have to get that contact. As we're driving down the road, this motorcycle passes us going the other direction. There's this guy on it, and he's got a child in the front of him and a child holding onto the back. And I said, damn it. I said, that's my level four. I'm going back right now. He goes, no, we can't. I says, we're going, Matt. I, I, Barry, I'm sorry. We're going. We're turning around. Turn around the car. So boom, we turn around the car, go back up to the parking lot. I get out. I'm talking to this, this guy who's this guy that came on the motorcycle with two kids. I said, hey, I'm sorry. Um, these guys are still in the back at the restaurant and stuff. You can go see them. I said, but I've got to go. But I do, I'm really interested in you coming and bringing these kids to this party. We had to arrest that guy. Because that guy knows where all the kids are. This guy had to go down. And so I exchanged contact information. I gave him some money for seeing those kids, and I gave him a little bit extra. I said, here's the deal. I will triple what you're getting right now if you bring these kids to the party on, on Super Bowl Sunday, on next Sunday. He goes, okay, I'll be there. So we get back in the car, because Barry, the whole time, he's got, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go, we gotta go. I'm like, freaking crap. So we're driving down the hill. And on the way down, I'm mad. I'm saying, Barry, you came, just you're stressing out about everything, and we came this close to blowing that operation by not being able to get to my level four. And I'm so glad that he came up when he did so I could, I could at least exchange contact information for it with him. But you need to chill out, bro. You need to chill out. We, I've worked for months on this operation undercover. 
We can't blow it just because you're stressed out about whatever some cooks are saying in, in Haitian in the, in, the, in the kitchen. Are you kidding me? And I actually told him, I said, Barry, just so you know, when we get home, I said, I'm going to buy you pink panties and you're going to wear them for two weeks because this is crap. I, I, was, I was totally going off on it. The reporter, Matt, was there and he's taking notes on everything all the way through, the whole energy of the whole thing. We get down to the bottom of the hill and there's this hotel that it was a high rise and, and there was a, a observation deck on the very, very top. So we pull in the underground parking there, so we're away from everything, and we go up on the top of the observation deck. Because from there, I can see the road that's coming down. And then all of a sudden, we, we're up there on the top, and I get a text. I get a text from Miss D. She's up there with Dolo and our level four trafficker. And she said, police are here, police are here, police are here. I'm like, What? She said, she said, Every, we're all getting arrested. Barry was freaking right. He was right. What had happened is those guys that were in the kitchen, they felt it. They heard the, the, the conversations about the sex party for these children. They saw the nine kids that were there. They brought on the ice cream and stuff. And evidently, we weren't careful enough in our conversations with them listening, and they called the local police. Now, here's the problem. This is a federal operation. The local police in almost every single one of our operations, the local police are tied in with the traffickers in some way. The local police, just like what happened in the Dominican, just like what happened in Mexico, all of these other operations, if the local police arrest the traffickers, then those traffickers will usually get out within 24 to 48 hours. It's inevitable because they don't have the resources to be able to really put them in jail for good. It's usually a federal case and, and the kids don't get rescued. If we were still there when those cops came, we would have lost months and months of undercover work and hundreds of children. Those traffickers represented hundreds of children. We had gotten to the head of the dragon. These were some of the worst traffickers in all of Haiti. In fact, they were connected with some very powerful political leaders as well. And so if Barry hadn't been listening to his intuition, and I, you know, I, I feel bad because so many times I tell my operators the importance of, of listening, realizing that this mission is more than just going in with the kids and pulling them out, just the physical part of it. This is a spiritual battle. There is light and darkness like you can't believe on both sides that are fighting this battle. And if you can learn to tune in to that still small voice of truth, that you could be led in ways that, in our case, found the children, help you have a healthier life. Whatever it is, you can be led. And for me to be so arrogant to think that I'm the only one that could feel that, that him, listening to his own spidey senses, knew that something bad was going down, I felt bad about that. And I, I said, I owe you a huge apology, Barry. I said, the cops are up there right now. You literally saved this entire operation with all of these children because you were listening. And, uh, and Barry was funny. He goes, he turns to the, the journalist that was there with us. He turns to the journalist and he said, he said, hey, um, Matt, you got all of that, right? He goes, yep, I got all of that. He's all jotting down notes and stuff. He said, even the part where he told me he's going to make me wear pink panties when we got home. He goes, yeah, if I got all of it. So I set up everything. This was Monday or Tuesday, flew back to the U.S. And because I had some things like, like one day that I was in the U.S. before I had to fly back for this operation. We had a whole bunch of operators. We had a, one of the guys that was donating money and resources to the foundation. One of our donors had a private jet, had a Gulfstream 650. Holy crap, that's a nice plane. And he said, look, you just find guys that can help pay for the, the gas. I'll donate my plane and you can get your entire team there. So I found a couple donors that would help out with the gas and everything else and jumped on the plane, flew to Florida, picked up, uh, picked up a huge celebrity there in Florida, and then we flew to Port-au-Prince, Haiti. At that point, everybody separated. Those guys went to get, get everything set up on the yacht, get everything set up at the beach area. I had told the traffickers, I said, listen, I'm going to meet you at this little restaurant area. We couldn't tell them exactly where the party was going to be because we didn't want to run the risk of any of them showing up. We don't want one of them showing up with five kids and then the other one an hour later or the other half an hour later. We have to have all the traffickers show up at the exact same time in order for everything to work like it should. So we're supposed to meet them at 1130 at this restaurant. 
At 11.30, only one trafficker had shown up with nine children. And I'm texting the other traffickers. I'm like, hey, we're waiting for the party. Where, where are you? Oh, yeah, sorry. It's, you know, it's a longer ways away than we thought or harder to be able to you know, get through some of the traffic. So each one of them was responding back to me in my text. But it wasn't until an hour later, 1230, that finally Dolo shows up with a bunch of kids. And we're like, okay, we've got a handful of them. But at this point, I think we only had about 15 children. And we had identified over 30 that needed to be there. Now, fortunately, we had geotagged the locations where many of them were keeping the kids. But the one that wasn't there was the one that we had no idea where they were getting their kids, which was Miss D and Dolo. We needed them there. They had to be there so that we could take down the entire operation. We're waiting there for an hour and a half for the rest of the traffickers. Finally, finally, this level four trafficker shows up. This guy was named Mike. This guy was as big of a piece of shit of any trafficker that I have ever met, ever. He relished in the abuse of children. In fact, he had videos of him abusing children on his, his iPad. He had this big iPad. And uh, he's like, hey, have you seen all the kids that we got coming here? And I said, yeah, yeah, we've got, we've seen them. He said, I got some more that are coming. I'll show you some of their pictures. And he opens up his iPad. I watched as he did his, his passcode on his iPad because he was standing there right next to me. I memorized that code because I knew that that would be vital for the federal agents to know how to get into that. Why? Because he had a whole bunch of pictures and videos of all of the horrible things that were going on with him, with Miss D, with the other traffickers that he was connected with because he was the supplier. And so, you know, I, I, I memorized that, that code to get in. I say, yeah, those are, you know, I, my boss is going to be super happy with some of those, those kids that are coming, et cetera. And I committed that number to memory so that later I could let the federal agents know exactly how to get into that iPad. So we were there for an hour and a half. Kids are getting hot. They're on their second round of ice creams by this time. And, and it's time. We've got to go. We had a little over 20 plus children. And we had 15 more that were unaccounted for. I texted the other traffickers. I said, listen, we've got to go. My boss is waiting. It's time for the party to start. I says, you don't get anything if you can't show up ASAP. They're like, we're close, we're close, we're close. I said, okay, meet us at this address, which was this beach area. We were far away from the city. We had secured um, a few little palapas in the middle of this beach. This, they were like kind of grass hut, little house type things that were there. And the yacht was parked right off the coast. It was a beautiful sight. The traffickers come in, they're like, oh, wow, that's great. I says, yeah, that's my, that's my boss's yacht right there. Tremendous credibility. I think they were ended up texting some of the other traffickers because there was a few others that I hadn't even met that showed up later, which was fantastic for the full takedown. So we take the children and we had them on the beach because we needed to have the people that were on the yacht see all of the children that were brought. So we had the children there on the beach and we said, okay, why don't you guys all go into this little, little palapa? Uh, we're getting eat quite some ice cream, got some drinks and stuff in there, got some food for you there. We needed to separate them from the traffickers. So they all go into this little safe house area. And then I tell the traffickers, I said, okay, that yacht there, the big boss is on it, but no guns, no knives, no problem, right? And so I made sure that they, all of their weapons, we put them in this little box, their, their knives, their guns and everything else. I says, we're going out there to meet the big boss, but they're super particular about making sure that nobody has any weapons. We have plenty of credibility. We got a freaking yacht out there, you know? I mean, what police department's going to afford a yacht to go bring in the traffickers? And so, so they completely trusted me at this point. We put all their weapons away and we get in this little dinghy boat, this little motor boat to go out to the yacht. And we're all sitting there on this boat going out to the yacht. We get there. And at that point, they have undercover cameras set up all over so that we can have the darkest conversation with these traffickers. We need to get them to say on camera exactly how many children they brought, how old they were, what they were selling them for, how much they were getting paid for them, what the children were willing to do, all of that stuff. This is a difficult conversation to have, but we needed to have it on camera. And the big influencers that were there, one of them, he's a big dude. He's almost seven feet tall. And, um, and everybody knows what his voice sounds like. And he was sitting there and he had this huge beard on from a, um, a makeup artist that 
help make him up. And he's laying there on this couch and this beautiful woman is fanning him with this uh, palm tree fan or whatever else, right? So he's just laying there, but he's close enough where he can hear the conversation. We've got the attorney general from Utah was there. We have a bunch of Navy SEALs and Green Berets, former guys that were there as, as security. And we're sitting at this back table having this conversation about these children. If you watch Operation Tucson, the only time that you see my face is right here. And I'm laughing with the traffickers because we don't have cameras. Everything else I told you this entire podcast, I don't got cameras hooked up all over the place. That would be dangerous to get in the door with some of these traffickers and the places that we had to go. And so, yes, of course, there's undercover cameras here so that they can later do the documentary and tell the story. At this point, we have every one of the traffickers have said exactly what they were willing to do, where the, where, how many kids they brought, how much money it was for, et cetera. At this point, the, the brand new CEO of the foundation we were working with at the time says, hey, I want to go and be part of this. Now, it gets pretty dicey in the takedown. I mean, there's guns in your face from the from the federal agents that are there. I mean, and there's a possibility the traffickers could have weapons as well. So, I mean, this is this is a dangerous place to be, especially if you're somebody that's kind of been behind the scenes running things, but he wanted to be there physically as we're handing out the cash, which was fine. We go back and we we go into this this house, one of the little bungalow things. So, we're in there to have this quiet private so that we could have all of the traffickers all there together. Well, unbeknownst to us, there was a few other traffickers that showed up with even more children because they had gotten the text from these traffickers. Yeah, this is legit. We got the, the yacht here and, and you know, I met the big boss and stuff. So these other traffickers bringing children end up showing up. So at this point, there was countless federal agents that stormed this entire operation, arresting the traffickers that were outside first and ran out of handcuffs. So by the time they came in back in inside and they busted through the door of where me and the, the CEO of the foundation and some of our operators and all of the other traffickers were, they only had a handful of additional handcuffs. So they, they threw us down on the ground and we're laying down there and they, they put handcuffs on each one of the traffickers. And then myself and the CEO of the foundation were laying there on the ground and they didn't have handcuffs left. They had zip ties. And I'm not talking little zip ties. I'm talking fat zip ties. And this, the agent who was on top of me that was putting zip ties on me, he wasn't at the meeting the night before. So he didn't know that we were good guys, right? So I'm getting handcuffed super hard, laying down there. And then he starts patting me down. Now, every single operation usually is what we do. We'll send all of our luggage beforehand to the airport. And when the whole sting goes down, they will put us in the police car and instead of going to jail, of course, they go straight to the airport and we're out of country and they take care of all of the legal logistics and everything after that. So in most cases, in order to get through security at the airport, I have to have my passport. So the only thing that I have physically on me on that very last part of the sting, I do have my passport and I had it zipped on in uh, one of my inside pockets of my pants. And so the, the federal agent who's putting the zip ties on me, he's patting me down. And he feels in this pants pocket, he feels my passport. And he doesn't know I'm a good guy, right? So he's taken all of the stuff out of my pockets. He's taken my passport out and puts it up on the evidence pile with all of the stuff that they had taken from the traffickers on this bed that was in the middle of the bungalow. And I'm, I'm laying there on the ground. I'm like, got my zip ties on. I'm like, oh, my real passport. I mean, I can't say anything. I got freaking traffickers everywhere. It would blow my own cover that I was involved, which I for sure don't want to have happen with the level of traffickers these guys were, right? And so they stand us up and they, the, uh, uh, by then they had taken some of the traffickers over to another place and the locals had found out that there was a child sex party that was going on and they were mad. They were pissed. And so they take us outside and they're taking us to the police car and these locals are throwing rocks at us, right? So they're like covering our heads and they're running us out to this police car and they, they put us in the back of this police car, me and the CEO of the foundation we were with at the time. And, and, uh, and he had, he had worked as the boss of the guy on Homeland Security. In fact, you would know him in the movie Sound of Freedom. He was the boss that told the Homeland Security agent, no, I'm sorry that you can't do that. I'm. This is Homeland Security. We can't just go around rescuing kids in Colombia, right? So this was who had played that, that part. And um, we, were, we were there in the car 
We were pulling out and the locals came and were boom, 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 just hitting on the back of the police car, showing their disgust of these guys that were trafficking children in their country. So we get out and it's it's just a war zone in there with all this crap going on. And we get outside the compound area, the beach, and the chief of the federal police was there in with us. And he turns around and he said, okay, I've, I've got handcuff keys to get you guys out of your handcuffs. And we're like, um, we're zip tied pretty hard too. And uh, do you have any, you have a knife? Do you have pliers? He didn't have either. We're like, okay, that kind of sucks. We're going to have to have these on for longer than we wanted. I said, but we have a bigger problem. I said, the federal agent who was patting me down pulled my passport out and stuck it with the, all this, all the trafficker stuff on the evidence pile. He said, well, that's a war zone in there. We can't go back there. I said, I know. He said, we have to wait until they bring all of the stuff to the, the police headquarters and we can pick it back up there. I'm like, crap. You know, I've got a freaking private jet with, with you know, all these celebrity guys and, and all the other operators from the yacht are waiting for me on the jet. So hopefully you don't have to wait too long, but okay. So we drive and uh, we get to the, the head police headquarters. We have to wait a little while. And finally they come with all the evidence stuff and he gives them a passport back. And so we take this passport. He takes me to the private jet. I get on. And one of my crowning moments of all of my undercover work was when I get on this plane and this influencer, he's almost seven feet tall, such a good man, huge heart. I've been a fan of his since I was a little kid, right? He stands up and these massive hands just boom, clapping as I get on. And I thought, you know what? Next to the joy of knowing that those children are free and back to their families, it doesn't matter to me that tens of millions of people don't know that I was the one that did the work there. The fact that he knows and, and he respects me for the work that I did, that means, that means everything to me. And so he asked to come and just sit down, just me and him, which was a dream come true for me to be able to sit with one of my mentors, a business mentor for many, many years, and be able to learn from him and exchange ideas all the way back to the United States. And uh, so it was beautiful. I've been to his home a few times since then. But then we get back to the US thinking this was this amazing rescue mission, 34 children plus upwards of 100 or more victims that were being sold by this trafficking network, these multiple trafficking networks that I had spent months and in infiltrating so that we could take it down. And the next thing we know, two weeks later, those traffickers had paid $80,000 to four corrupt judges to be let out of prison. And they were back on the streets and they were back trafficking children. And they were back involved two weeks later. Now, to put that into perspective, $80,000 is like, is like millions. The average income in Haiti is just a few hundred dollars a year. $80,000 is an entire lifetime worth of work. So to put that into letting these guys out of prison, it tells you they had some deep-pocketed resources that they were pulling from to make that happen. Here's the scary thing. Because of the fact that my passport had been taken, those corrupt judges had to come up with a story of why they were letting these guys out. So the story that they told the Senate, the that they told the president, they told the, 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 the media, the story they said is that the real bad guys wasn't the traffickers that got put in prison. The real bad guys were the Americans that got away. And it wasn't Paul Stone, it wasn't Paul Steele, it wasn't Paul Black, it wasn't any of my undercover profiles. It was Paul Hutchinson. Why? Because the passport that was there on the evidence pile happened to get entered in to the computer before it ever got returned to me. And so the real me ended up being on Haiti's most wanted list as somebody who was, who was trafficking and buying and selling children in their country. Now, now we have a problem. I can't go back to Haiti. And all these traffickers are out. The corrupt judges are getting away with it. So we flew in the first lady, the uh, attorney general, the head of the federal police, their whole entourage, these diplomats into the US, flew them all the way to Utah to have them come and and hear the full case, all the details. And we're, we're talking to each one of them. We're giving them the details of what happened on that rescue mission. I showed them pictures, I showed them texts and videos and all of this stuff. 
And the chief of police guy, he stands up and he said, you know, I am so mad. I don't care if I lose my job. I don't care if I lose my life. I'm going to fix the corruption in my country for the sake of these children. And so they all were super committed to go back. The problem is I can't go back now. My name and my face, I'm freaking Hades Most Wanted for a little bit. And then a whole separate team to go rearrest all the traffickers and to take down those four corrupt judges. And that's exactly what they did. Well, fast forward, we, we had gotten so high level with the, with the corruption and with the traffickers being tied in with judges and other politicians, et cetera, that there was massive civil unrest. And you might remember this almost a decade ago, about seven years ago, where there was tires burning in the street. There was all of this unrest back and forth. In fact, eventually, unfortunately, that the president himself ended up getting assassinated. So, you know, if you understand that the president can get assassinated, that the, the one of my operators there ended up getting killed, this is a dangerous area. This is a dangerous area of the world. And I'm super grateful that after all of those times in deep cover, face to face with the most despicable people selling children, I am so grateful that I didn't end up with a with a bullet, that I didn't end up getting shot for real like I did in that in that training. So um, this rescue ended up, like I say, not only with the rescue of 34 children, but taking down trafficking networks that went all the way to the top in the political spectrum in Haiti. And, and I want to give the credit to my team. Every single time I went in, I had different members of the team. A few of them came four or five times on those operations, giving the credit to Barry for listening to the intuition and feeling that we were in a dangerous place. We would have lost all of those kids if I had to blow my cover that day with the local police who were doing that arrest. And then fast forward, I ended up getting a phone call from the chief of police. And he said, Paul, he said, you were one of the closest to uh, some of these trafficking networks. We have some other leads of, of where we can find Guardi. And uh, he said, I'd, I'd love to have your help on some of those. My exact answer was this. I said, Jim, you know I was Haiti's most wanted at one point. He goes, yeah, now you're Haiti's most protected. I said, that doesn't make me feel very good. Right. You know, in fact, those next two operations, we ended up flying into the Dominican side to be able to come in from that side to work in the jungle region. And that's one of the, the scenes that you saw on, on the on the movie Sound of Freedom there in the jungle. Uh, me and some other guys went in dressed as doctors and uh, offering a free health care clinic for a bunch of these kids that were in this region so that we could identify the ones that were being trafficked and see if we could follow up on that little boy that was kidnapped in front of the church house. This has been a high action one, super dangerous situation. I'm grateful for my safety and the safety of my team. I'm grateful for you and taking time to listen to the Liberating Humanity podcast. I'm Paul Hutchinson. This has been another episode of Liberating Humanity. If it's something that you enjoyed or you learned something from, please forward this to, to friends. Please click the like button below. Please subscribe. And, uh, and we have a lot more fun things coming, more about healing the world, which has to happen in order for us to eradicate child trafficking. Thank you for spending time with me today.